Welcome to Pixel Fondue. I'm Greg, and today we have Teresa Ter Anania. Is it Anania or Anania? I should have Close. asked you that before. Anania. Anania. I would not have gotten that. Okay, <laughs> Teresa Anania from Autodesk. And you are, let me get this one right. Is it the senior coordinator of subscription subscriber success? How is your job title exactly spelled out? Senior director of subscriber success. Senior director of subscriber success. So that's uh, that sounds like a dangerous job title. That's that sounds like senior director of feeding the crocodiles by hand or something. And they offered that to you, I'm sure. <laughs> no. No, no. And, Okay, and as everybody can see, Teresa is a actual person from Autodesk. There's no wires hooked into her. She's not some sort of uh, automaton built in the labs in Autodesk, 3D printed out. And um, just a little bit of history, how we got here. About, I don't know, maybe six weeks ago, uh, I went out, we were just doing a regular Pixel Fondue roundtable for you, those of you who watch us on a regular basis. And I went on a bit of a rant about a um, letter from Autodesk that happened to have Teresa's name at the bottom. And I went through that, and I think within about uh, Autodesk, the, the letter was about Autodesk's recent move to subscription, and, and, and specifically it was about um, uh, current uh, owners of their software and how they may transfer over. And we'll get to that in a, in a minute. But um, within, I don't know, like a, a day, Teresa had emailed me and said, I enjoyed your, your, <laughs> enjoyed your broadcast, and would you like to talk about anything? And I thought, OK, that's interesting. Um, and so I said, oh, well, hey, if we're going to talk, why don't we talk live? And I invited her to come on Pixel Fondue, and she agreed, much to my uh, delight. I'm very happy to have you here. And that was a, probably six weeks ago. We both have been traveling, and this is, you know, eventually we, um, you know, came to some terms and uh, sent out uh, some. Uh, I had written up some questions and asked the community for some questions about um, subscription. And I, I hopefully I did a decent job putting those together into, you know, the answer everybody's questions about this and inquiries. And um, and so here we are. So Teresa, before we kind of get into the nuts and bolts of subscription and all that stuff, why don't you? Just tell us a little bit about yourself. You know, people in this industry, in particular, tend to come from many different avenues. I had a bio. I'm a biology major, which just seems weird. I don't know. You know, and I had some circuitous route to getting into 3D animation. So, why don't you let us know? Tell us about yourself. How you got here? How you wound up as the uh, senior manager for subscriber success at Autodesk? Great. Okay, great. Well, first of all, I just want to thank you for having me on, Greg. Um, this is really important for us to be able to share a little bit more about the insights and some of the vision that we have at Autodesk moving to subscription, but also just to add some clarity around some of the recent communications. So thank you so much for having me. Um, of my education is in accounting and information systems. So I spent eight years at Ernst & Young doing uh, client services and got my MBA and CPA. So yes, an interesting start for a high tech girl. Um, but I quickly found I was passionate about software, so I joined a company and actually ran it for 15 years at, um, it's called Elgar, a finite element analysis business. I was COO, and about eight years ago, Autodesk acquired Elgor. so I've been part of the Autodesk family ever since. And I started at Autodesk in the software sales business and uh, global simulation, and then joined our product group, um, product strategy and vision. And then um, really felt passionate about getting closer back to the customer and working with our resellers more. So I joined our marketing strategy group. And I've been part of that for the last few years, mostly in manufacturing. That's my background. Um, but about three years ago, it actually in tandem with our move to subscription, um, Autodesk invested in my current organization. It's subscriber success. It's all about really um, being kind of the voice of the customer at our table and whether we're making changes, whether we're changing licensing or improving the experience, my team is working across the organization. Um, so the two big things we do is actually focus on the customer experience. So any of the pain points they might have in interacting with Autodesk, we try to again minimize things like instant access, um, using accounts to set up users in a more user-friendly way, uh, how to get helpful support quickly from Autodesk. And then the other thing we do is we focus on the learning path. So one of the key charters we have is to make sure our customers are successful using what they buy. So we do things like curating and serving up helpful learning content so that they can actually get the most out of their software. 
Well, that's but, key. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, it's okay. Whoops. Sorry to interrupt you there. I'll let you get back to. I'll let you get back to that. But yeah, I agree. That's key. Um, learning content, and that's one of the reasons we started Pixel Fondue. Is it's you know a lot of this software takes years to learn, and it's real barrier Absolutely. of entry. Now that it's actually affordable, or mostly affordable to a lot of people, there's a huge uh, desire for learning content. Let me let me go ahead and finish what you're saying. I have a couple of quick uh, just questions regarding some of the things you said. Go ahead and wrap up. Uh, oh, I, I just wanted to say one of the coolest things I love about my job is I get to interact with customers each and every day. So whether it's AU or big event with thousands of customers or just one-on-one -on -one conversations, I mean, that's the best part of my job. Just wanted to. Yeah. Okay. That. So it sounds like you've been through the whole system, starting with um, that company that was acquired by Autodesk. Was that um, like a medium-sized company? Was it a really big company? Was it a smaller small, company? Small. I would say small to medium. So you know what it's like to work at a small or medium-sized company and how um, those types of companies are often... Um, you know, some well, obviously the, the job you're in limited by cash flow and things like that. And yep. th you know, some of those things we're going to touch on later in terms of subscription and uh, maintenance um, with regards to running a smaller, medium-sized company. And Absolutely. in terms, of, yeah, so so that's good to know you've been there and you've been in sales. So you know, also you've c connected with customers that way. And I assume you've been selling from everybody to people like uh, my production company, Sabretooth Productions, a small uh, production company mm -hmm. in Silicon Valley, all the way up to maybe an ILM or a Pixar or a place like that. Um, now, most of the people watching this are going to be um, in content creation. So they'll be using Autodesk products like Maya, 3D Studio Max, uh, things like that, Motion Builder, uh, Mudbox. Right. Um, Probably some ex soft homage users on here watching, wondering, you know, what where this is going. Um, and so, you know, Autodesk University AU, you mentioned, is a way to get out there and, and talk to some co uh, customers. Have you ever been to SIGGRAPH, for instance, where a lot of people like me hang out once a year? SIGGRAPH down in yeah, I haven't. I, I know many of our um, colleagues have, but no, I haven't had an opportunity to go to that one. I go to a lot of other events. So you're on um, the East Coast, and you know, I'm out here in California, and it's I, I've worked with um, some of your competitors before in the past with my other company, Dassault and SolidWorks and those guys. They all seem to be on the East Coast. See, I don't know if that's just a divide, like the engineering's over there, and California's got the creative stuff. I don't, I'm just saying, like, talk to those people at Autodesk, get them to get you a ticket up to LA for SIGGRAPH, and um, mix in with some of the people there, and you'll get a feel for, because the industry is so, it's a small industry, first of all, um, media and entertainment, and a, lot, and a lot of them are localized around LA, or a lot of them just come to SIGGRAPH, and it's a good place just to sort of meet these kinds of people, people like me, and uh, even people from larger companies. So, um, oh, just so you know, my team handles across all of our industries, so I do visit our m and &E customers all the time, and I see oh, them good. in their region. I travel all over the world, so um, I'm often meeting with customers just like you're describing. Oh, you, I, I don't know if you give us a I know you've mentioned, have you, so you travel, yeah, so obviously it's it's a global enterprise, and uh, uh, but yeah, just say I'd love, we'd love to see you out there, and I'm sure being the voice of a customer I think is important important and one of the reasons um you came on really and contacted me one of the reasons i i sort of tried to convince you to come on thinking initially you wouldn't is you know i really like it when there is a sort of voice of the customer and there's a a, a face you know behind a corporation <laughs> and autodesk in particular like you know people um tend to have a mindset towards larger companies that are a little bit different than smaller companies. So, sure. you know, there are there's some large companies like local around here fruit companies that can do no wrong, <laughs> but there's um, you know, a look at a company in our space like uh, Pixel Logic. It makes a, a mm -hmm. really cool program called ZBrush, uh, really beloved by the um, industry. And Autodesk, I think partially just because of their size and the way they communicate sometimes um, there's an automatic distrust and animosity towards a large company. So part of that, is, I'm just sort of getting this out of the way because I'm glad that you came on and hopefully uh, maybe this could be a regular thing and, or, or something like that. And there could be a, a more of a, a rapport between um, customers who can't make it to an event and you know Autodesk uh, people. Totally agree. I, I just want to quickly mention, you're so right. First of all, I heard from various customers that I talked with about this program. They felt like, Maybe Autodesk just doesn't care about the small customer. And that just couldn't be further from the truth, Greg. I mean, we care a lot. A big significant portion of our subscription and maintenance space is made up of very small businesses and small shops. And so we've been listening. We've been talking to customers. I'm not saying we have it 
perfectly um, laid out in the program as is, but I will tell you their input has already made a difference. Just real quick, one of the things that they were concerned about, I talked to a customer in M&E, had a need to go back to prior versions, and he was worried about our, he felt our subscription offer was too restrictive. We only allowed initially three versions back. So one of the things we just announced, and it's based on customers like yourself, feedback is that we're going to allow customers that move to subscription to retain all the prior versions that they had when they were owning the perpetual license before they traded it in. Fan, so, that's fantastic yeah. to hear. And it sounds like maybe that is, a, well, we'll get into the details of that. Brand but new. Th that, that is fantastic to hear. Um, and it's really important because as somebody who does long productions, sometimes you're doing a production from over a year. Um, I Correct. do a lot of the uh, uh, live exhibit work, the animation work at the Monterey Bay Aquarium at Sabretooth. And these are projects that sometimes are 12 to 16 months long. You're not going to upgrade a version in the middle of a project that you're about to deliver. Correct. And you need to be able to have access to older versions, older files. You can't risk any sort of bugs that come out that inevitably come out with complex software and new versions. So that's great to hear. Um, getting into, well, let's just start from uh, the beginning, I guess. Uh, you guys made an announcement, what is it, in March maybe, that this mm -hmm. announcement came out? March, mid-March. March. And you know, when I interviewed uh, Shane and Derek from the Foundry, oh, I don't know, uh, last week or a couple weeks ago, I tried to make a distinction between sort of uh, hobbyists, and I'm not sure there's as many hobbyists in the um, Autodesk and Mini market as there are in, in Moto. It's a little more expensive. Uh, but hobbyists and people who are who maybe are successful in their careers, there's people who've worked at uh, the Jet Propulsion Labs who are interested in getting an animation as a career change. And so they're yes. trying to learn the software on the side, and they're paying for it themselves. And uh, then there's small businesses, small and medium-sized businesses, like Sabretooth, like a business I own is a small, yeah. pretty pretty small business. But they're you know anywhere up to 10 to 15, you know, 20, 30, those are all pretty small uh, and yeah. can be fragile businesses um, yeah. in this area. And then, of course, you have the Pixars and the Ubisofts and the ILMs and and uh, that, you know, probably haven't been expressing their opinion on this much, and they're probably uh, happy about a lot of this. But a lot of the pushback, I think, when this came out, there was a bit of um, uh, unhappiness and <laughs> anger directed at Autodesk towards a move to subscription <laughs> only. And a lot of that is based on uh, fear and sort of what you said earlier, like they don't care about us. They, they obviously don't care about us. They're taking away our choice. And it's not just an emotional response, to be fair here. There's some pretty solid uh, financial arguments you could make that uh, continuing on maintenance for current customers is a, is a makes more sense to people who already own the software than going to subscription. Um, so there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a great video game trailer from a game called a Deus Ex Mankind Divided. And if you haven't watched that, go watch that. It's, probably, it's one of the best video game trailers ever made. But it starts okay. off with the character saying, I didn't ask for this. He kind of says it like, I didn't ask for this. And uh, <laughs> that's how I think a lot of people feel when they all of a sudden it's like, hey, Adobe did this a few years ago. We're going to subscription. And they're like, what? This was working out just fine. I didn't ask for this. Um, so do you think Autodesk understands the sort of emotional state and actual you know, X's and O's of, of small businesses like mine where we put the numbers down um, with regards to the subscription announcement, this sort of massive change they've made with the way they offer their software? Yeah, I think, I mean, what you're describing is definitely what I've heard from many of our customers. So this is not brand new information. I mean, not everyone is ready to make the move to subscription. That is very clear. So it is why we are definitely making sure the customers that want to make the move have a great offer to do so. And those that don't feel comfortable that staying in the perpetual and maintenance world is absolutely fine. Now, one other thing I want to mention, Greg, is that Today, we have a couple of things that customers have said really give them an advantage to move to subscription, even without the future plans that we have. And that really includes things like, you know, the new access to the collections portfolio if they need more products available at a fraction of what they cost today, even can in you, the future. Can you yeah, so we, have, we have a collection that basically we have designed for each of the industries. So it, in, it includes all of the essential software that that industry may need at one price point. So it's a very convenient way to administer the access of 
you know, instead of buying each product separately, like you would have done in perpetual, or even with our suites previously, I don't know if you recall, we had levels like standard, premium, ultimate, we've just simplified the buying process immensely by offering a collection for our subscribers um, in, let's say, the M&E space. So that's so, just one advantage. Yeah. So let me, let, let me put that uh, to a test a little bit because yeah. I, I did have this on my desk. So I do own a, this is the Maya Entertainment Creative Suite. And this was in 2012. So you were mm -hmm. offering um, suites back then. I think it had Maya, yes. Max, Mudbox, Motion Builder, and Softimage, which was subsequ subsequently discontinued. Um, and so, you know, that was, you know, easy to buy. So what, it, I guess, is there a price discount previously? Because I can't imagine it's really that much so, easier to grab. Well, it is in the sense that many of our M&E Suites customers had to choose at each level, standard, premium, and ultimate, which one was best for them. And that was complex in the buying process. And then also many of them bought individual products that added to those suites. Again, another decision they had to budget for, et cetera. The collection now just puts all of this together. And it's basically at the price of what the suite would have been in the premium level and just makes it a lot easier to facilitate, not to mention what is coming in the area of new innovation to these collections now in subscription. There's a lot of cloud file sharing. There's a lot of connected services. There's a lot of workflow work that's going into um, making that collection more and more valuable. That's just one example of where customers have said they actually preferred to move to subscription because they wanted to take advantage of the collection. Um, right. Another right. one has been in the area of, you know, more predictable costs. So they've been able to, I told you about the guy that had the contractor come in for an extra project. This is the same Max Meyer user. He had a new project and felt like, you know, I don't want to buy a, you know, $5,000 perpetual asset. He was able to just get a quarterly subscription. And then when that project ended, he dropped the subscription. So, you know, that in, in the area of user administration, there's been some simplification for subscription. The point is, Greg, we have a lot of value in it today, but I am fully aware it may not convince many of our smaller customers that it is better. So my point is, give us a year. I could put my name on this, Greg, that we are going to be coming out with some significant advancements in the area of subscription, and maybe customers in another year will feel differently. Well, okay, so that all sounds great. And uh, when you come out with those, come up back on here and we'll, sh we'll share that with everybody. I'm I thinking it, it sounds maybe a little like what Adobe has done, where they've they simplified it by just giving everybody everything. Uh, they used to have packages. I know you're not doing that, but uh, maybe something a little bit more similar with M&E. Working you're towards just that. Working yes. towards that. And so yes. uh, and they also offer uh, cloud-based services with storage, and which, which honestly, every every Every, I've got 37 different free storage options right now. But uh, Autodesk does, this is more significant. If you don't, if you don't, what I would suggest, instead of offering everybody storage, because everybody has storage, it's like five bucks okay. from Google for 50 gigabytes or whatever, is offer more uh, cloud rendering services for programs yes. like Maya 3D Studio Max. Yes. People really can use that. And yes. as, as somebody who, especially smaller companies like mine, we don't have our own render farm. I spend many, many thousands of dollars a year on render right. farms. If that were to come with a subscription, that's yeah. actual money to me. Yeah. So that's that's money. That might as well be a check to Rebus Farm, who I use now, who are great. But you know, I'm happy to use Auto. Sorry, Rebus. I'm <laughs> I'm happy to use Autodesk. Um, and and uh, okay, so there's that. I think um, that kind of leads me to the next question, though. I think there's no question. There's a argument for subscription. Part of it, especially, is the lack for new users. It's a lack of enough upfront cost. And so, right. you know, back in the day, I would have jumped on subscription before I shelled out whatever I did for Correct. the suite, like t ten grand or something. Um, so, so I don't think anybody's disputing that. I think what people wanted to see was an option, something like uh, the Foundry has maintained an option to buy or subscribe. Uh, Cinema 4D, other your other really, I think all your other competitors in this space offer an option of perpetual or subscription. And I guess why? What was going wrong with the option? Why? Where did that yeah. go? 
No, I hear you. Again, I'm hearing this from a lot of customers. I mean, first of all, you bring up a great point that many companies in the software industry are moving to a subscription model. They might be leaving available a perpetual option as well, but it's clear we're not the only company doing this, okay? No, not the I only think company. you know that, right? And, and it's also clear that every company is doing it in a different way. I mean, you look at how Microsoft did it, you look at how Adobe did it, Autodesk is doing something even different from those two. So I, I get your point that both tracks would be ideal from your perspective, but I think we mentioned even in the letter, um, which was another point that I want to clarify, that the cost is just increasing immensely to run both businesses. And I know some have said, um, how is that possible? You know, Autodesk is a big company. Why would yeah, it cost so too explain, much? Yeah, explain this to us because so, I, I know I brought that up. And right. I think it's a legitimate point because well, before you get into it, let, let me yeah. just just from here's the optics on it to, to yeah. give with if you've been watching way too much CNN like me lately. Optics, right? So the optics were, you know, we're going subscription only. You guys have perpetual licenses. By the way, maintenance is going to increase 5% next year, 10% the year after that, 20% the year after that. And I'm kind of guessing even more after that. So I'm feeling like the old, you know, I'm walking the plank and I got a little sharp stick in my back. Like, you guys really want me on subscription, don't you? What's the catch here? Because you're raising this and you, you do say in the letter without elaborating that costs have gone up. But like, I, yeah, I look at auto, like when I buy Maya or when I, when I uh, update my creative suite, which I just did um, last yeah. month my reseller contacts me and mm -hmm. I, I pay them. Uh, RFX, by the way, I'm gonna give them a plug because they've been great for years. You probably know RFX, don't you? Mm -hmm. RFX, mm -hmm. anyway. So RFX calls me, there's a woman uh, with the name Lovely, lovely woman, name, what, her name's Lovely, and I give her my check or my uh, credit card and she gives it to me. I never deal with Autodesk, so I guess what's the, what's the yeah. cost? Yeah, I can imagine that's a good question. Many of your customers have, and really what it comes down to, Greg, you can imagine having a perpetual and a maintenance business model and a subscription one, there's a lot of resources that go into managing both. So everything from the way that the customer experience is different in the way they download the software, install, get updates, the way we deliver the software, the way we administer you know, the licensing models. I mean, this takes the way we support all the different versions, You know, not only perpetual, but also those on subscription. It has been a, a very increase in cost over the last couple of years. But I want to mention the biggest news on this is really coming from our customers. So many of our customers have you know, tried the subscription model and added it to their perpetual environment. We call these hybrid environments now. They have both perpetual and some subscription. And they actually tell us their costs are just increasing because they're administering both sets of you know licenses and that is what really you know spawned them to ask us to come up with a program to let them move to subscription so that they could consolidate their licenses and get everything under one licensing but, but to be fair i'm guessing those are are large companies i'd um, say medium medium to large companies yes anything dollars. where they have a multi-user environment as an example or even lots of single users yes it's, 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 I'm, I'm going to push back on you a little bit, yeah. Teresa. Um, and, and listen, you, you've you probably already answered this question a million times, but like, like I administer licenses. It's not a huge amount of work on the consumer. And if it's small, I'm thinking a small company with like maybe 15 people or something, they usually have like a, at least a part-time IT person instead of just having one of the animators run around like I do. Um, and the, the, the other flip side of the coin is companies much smaller than Autodesk, and maybe this rolls into the cost differently, are doing right. both. So they, you know, if, if, if Maxon can handle it and Foundry and uh, right. uh, I'm not sure if SideEffect has gone to script, uh, subscription at all yet, but if, if they can handle it, then I think, well, why can't Autodesk? And maybe you guys and, have 20 times the customers. Like, I don't and it's a, it, no, it's a great question, and I would say we could. Here's the thing. We passionately believe that subscription is just better for our customers. Not only is it what they're asking for in many cases, not all, and as I said, not all customers are ready to make that move today, but we're looking forward, Greg, at all the things that they want to do to make their products or buildings faster, cheaper, stronger, more innovatively. And the only way we can truly deliver on an unbelievable level of innovation in a streaming way for our subscribers and customers is to do it in a way where we're putting 
our money into that innovation. So yes, any company can survive and manage, you know, but it was a business decision. And I believe, I really believe in my heart of hearts, a great one for our customer ultimately, because we're going to be delivering greater, greater value. And the only way to do that well is to basically simplify and do something really well. Now that said, I'm not telling you maintenance and perpetual are going away. As we talked about, that is still a viable option. I realize the price is increasing, but the other thing too, Greg, if you look at even after those price increases, what we charge compared to many of our competitors, we're still well below the market in many cases, and you usually get more capability than not. So I think for those reasons, that's why we're making this shift. So, and listen, I, I realize you're dealing with, um, far bigger, uh, a far larger market than just M&E uh, or DCC. I, I don't know if it's called media and entertainment, but we generally call ourselves, I think, digital content creators. Right. Um, and that's, I understand that's not the biggest part of Autodesk and you have a lot of responsibilities beyond that. And those customers, if you're using Revit or something, uh, AutoCAD, massive program, these absolutely, um, I think it's maybe a different situation, or at least it's not a situation I'm keyed into. I'm only keyed into the forums and online communities of, of digital content creators. Yes. And I, I do think that um, outside of the larger companies, digital content creators uh, aren't convinced yet, but that's fine. I think what you said is give us a chance, give us a year, Give me one us, year. Give us an opportunity <laughs> to show you, because I'm not sure it's, you're, you're gonna get there through simplification or support or those things like that. I Usually, you. you know, we're, you're talking about 3D software users. I hear so these you. Are very, uh, these aren't Microsoft Word people, right? Um, so, so I think you have to get through value and services. So I think, like I said, 3D rendering, that's a service you can offer yes. in addition to yes. the software. Um, you know, storage is fine or everything. Maybe there's some online collaboration you can offer. Maybe there's Absolutely. even, um, you have specials like all oh, Maya subscribers get to use Flame for a month. Okay, Once you love it. There's an idea, idea. something like that. Yeah. People have been, if you're mm -hmm. old like me, you've been drilling over Flame since uh, whatever. And, and, and I see that now, it's like, okay, that's, you know, doing subscription for that. But something like that, maybe you have a, a week where, you know, let's, you know, try software week or a Steam event, like if you're familiar with how Steam works um, and the video game side of things. I think that would be a way to um, increase value and I think really convince fence sitters like myself that, hey, you know what, this is, if they're putting their resources towards this instead of perpetual licenses, that's coming back to me, and at the end of the day, this is good. Even if I'm paying more, if I'm paying an extra five hundred bucks a year, I may be getting a thousand bucks in three D rendering a year. So that's that's a that's an improvement for me, right? So, and I look at Adobe as a as as a sort of a leader in this, I suppose you could say, because Adobe did this a number of years ago. They took a giant risk. I think it's paid off for them. Um, I'm not watching their stock, but it seems like they're doing well. Uh, at least mm -hmm. they're continuing on, and yeah, they offer they they offered a lot of value for a very little price, and um, mm -hmm. and they let people keep their perpetual licenses, which it sounds like you guys are doing. So so why don't why don't we well, just wait? Uh, let me just let me clarify on that point on the perpetual license because the change we made is they have access to the prior versions. Now they still have to trade in their perpetual asset. That isn't okay. changing. Okay, but I I just want to share. Um, the reason that, because some of the questions I've gotten from customers, and I think you've heard, is why would we have to do that? And I think it should just be clear, Greg, that first of all, no one's being forced to trade in their perpetual license. If they want to remain on maintenance, they can. Um, the, the other thing I think up. is the price is going up, but again, <laughs> still below much of our competition. And, and you can't buy multiple still, years of maintenance at once either. You used to be able to buy like five years of maintenance at once. So you yeah, can't do that anymore true. either. So you're de-incentivizing, you, you are, you're de-incentivizing maintenance. Well, again, and we're trying to add more and more value to subscriptions. So you see this as really a greater good. But until that time, some of our customers, like I talked to a guy that has 30 licenses and he is uncomfortable trading all 30 in to move to subscription at a fraction of the price. I mean, it's a 30? He has 30 licenses of perpetual. And um, and basically okay. what, what he's going to do is just trade in, you know, 20 of them and then keep 10. He can, because uh, customers have expressed some fear in case their business has a downturn. You know, their worry is that they can't afford the subscription price and they want to go back to that perpetual asset. 
And so this is a way that he felt comfortable moving forward, getting the benefit of subscription, but still retaining some assets for use later. And I mean, will he ever need those? Will he, he's been paying maintenance for years? Probably not, but it's that safety net. And so I think, again, each customer has to have a conversation to understand their options. That was one of the things in that letter that I realized could not answer all questions and you laughed at. But at the same time, um, the call to action there was really to have a conversation, whether it be with me or someone from my team or one of the resellers that have sold um, in the past to our customers. They're willing and want to walk through the facts. So every so, customer you know, understands what their options are. Right. So let's. Um, I do want to go through the letter a little bit and, and just give you an opportunity to clarify some things. And again, just if you hadn't watched the previous video to sort of point out my issues with the language, I guess you could say. Um, and I do want to clarify the trade in aspect and it's, it, it, the details as much as we can. Yeah. Um, I had another question. Yeah. Oh, that's what it was cash flow. So, and you had brought it up and you've been a part of another business. And that's a, an issue with uh, subscription where if you don't have 30 licenses, maybe you have like two or four or something like right. that. Um, and the hesitancy to turn that over is a cash flow issue because it really is akin to when you when you're running a small business, you know that things like rent, payroll, uh, insurance, mm -hmm. a lot of those uh, taxes you may owe in the previous year, those things are going to get priority. And you don't have much flexibility with them. You don't have any flexibility with them. Healthcare, mm -hmm. you don't have any flexibility. You have to pay those month by month. And mm -hmm. something like um, a traditional software upgrade path, not maintenance, not subscription, where it used to be where I would get a notification, Maya 4 is coming out. Uh, if you want to upgrade, you can let it, you know. So you pick your time to upgrade based on the current state of your projects, based on cash mm -hmm. flow. And right now, with everybody going to subscription, and it does feel like that, although some people are still off offering um, uh, perpetuals alongside, you get the feeling if this is successful for Autodesk that you know they're the market leader. And if you guys uh, are successful with this, then it's probably where it's going to go for everybody. And it, it is a bit nerve wracking as a business owner to think, OK, if I'm not intelligently spacing out my subscription renewals, and they all hit me once, like a tax, like a uh, you know, like a like a large, like a house, like I live in California, we get drilled twice a year on property tax, right? Uh, right, and so you have to. That's a cash flow issue, and it, it's a double. It's it's sort of a double whammy because if you can't pay it and your software no longer works, you can't work. You can't. You're done. You're done. Right. You can't. You, you can't work. The software doesn't work. You can't just go buy more software and use it. 3D animation software takes a very long time to learn. I can't just go get Houdini and learn it. I mean, it's like a year. Um, so what I'm getting at is I feel like as a customer, customers don't have any leverage in this conversation. Um, we, we can't uh, just go out and easily learn another so uh, software package. Uh, we have years worth of, in my case, and many like mine, past projects that come back year after year this, you know, in my or mm -hmm. 3D Studio Max, which I need the program to load them up and, you know, continue to do that work. And if it's coming to subscription only, I appreciate being able to use the uh, keep my perpetual and pay maintenance, but that cost is going up. Um, I do feel a little bit crunched by Autodesk and the offering that I'm seeing with subscription. And we did the math earlier and I could pop up. Um, uh, uh, you had a, a sample with Auto uh, AutoCAD that we want to show. The math yeah. I did, the math I did didn't show subscription as a better financial option. And so so why don't I guess I guess I want you to understand our situation and maybe maybe you could talk us if you want to talk us through this visual maybe that'll help. Yeah, let's let's do that. One thing I just okay. want to comment on is the things you bring up. Like I ran a small business, so I get your point that the predictability of of cost is really critical. And I think that is one thing we hear actually many customers value about subscription is that you know especially the track we're offering our loyal customers to move over for basically the same as your maintenance price you've been spending each year, I mean, that's a very predictable cost. And while they're paying that each year, they also have the advantage that if they're not getting the value out of the software, if they have a project that ends and they don't need the software for several months or a year, they can just drop their number of subscriptions. Maybe instead of the three or four you mentioned, they only have two. So whereas in the maintenance world, they had to really keep that's that insurance true. contract, if you will, um, up to date because otherwise they would be faced with the cost of perpetual when they needed an upgrade. And I know as a small business, you know, getting hit by my 
my folks in the uh, the team that wanted an update and it was like a big expense that I didn't expect, that was really tough to manage too from a cash flow standpoint. Yeah, you're, so you're I hear you. Yeah. <laughs> you're absolutely right about that. Subscription offers a better option for scaling up or down. Uh, I used to work at a production company out here, way, if you remember the dot com days back in the. Uh, oh, the, yeah. Where everybody um, was doing a, a huge amount of business was being done. Um, and this is when Maya first came out. When Maya first came out, Maya was something like $30,000. Mm -hmm. And that was not something you just bought for one project, right? Right. And so we would have a project come in that would require it, but nobody knew how to use it. So we'd have to Correct. get a, find a guy who could use it and that we had to buy it. And we eventually just okay. bought it. It was used for that one project and then went to the shelf until I took it home with me and learned how to use it. <laughs> because, um, so yes, absolutely. There is a place for subscription there. And that is a, a very, that is fair to me. It is fair to note that everybody. So if everybody's going to yell at me later about that, <laughs> uh, absolutely fair <laughs> to note that because there are absolutely are situations where subscription matters. And I subscribe software here at Sabretooth. I subscribe software where it makes sense. Um, so, so that is, uh, that is fair. So, did you, let me bring up. Um, if yeah, you want, let's you want, bring up me, an example. Yeah. So let me do this. Boom, and choose the window, and choose my financial returns. No, I mean this one here, and uh, present to right, everyone. I can so see it. We're good. Okay. So here I is a visual can. aid. Yeah, I, I believe. Let me just double check our streaming. Um, I think everybody can see it. Yeah, everybody can see it. Okay, great. So just working from the left side, let's start with that. This is basically meant to show an example customer choice in our new offer. This on the left is where that customer chooses to stay on maintenance, okay? So in this year, this calendar year, this is AutoCAD in the North America US dollars example. They would be spending 570, you know, this year and then as you indicated another 10% on top of that. Next year it's 625. And then another 20% on top of that, which is $750 a year. Now, everyone's been asking, and I tried to clarify on the blog, well, what happens in year four? Um, I think it's pretty impressive we as a company put out three years of pricing. I don't know many other companies that have done that, but they kind of encouraged us. This is, again, where we're listening to the customer. They encouraged us to provide some guidance on what's going to happen in years four and after. And our guidance is that we can't be specific about if we would do an, a price increase after those years, but in maintenance, you can expect there might be some increases. So it could be anywhere from, we said, in a range of zero to 20%. So I just then put the range of what you'd be spending as that customer remaining in maintenance, 750 to 900 a year. And I you know, show that for the next two years. So now let's move over to the right where um, our customer decides they're going to take our offer this year and move to subscription. As I said, um, that customer can make that move this year at the same cost as their maintenance. So that's why it's 570 in the first year. And now they're getting access to the, the uh, subscription version of their software, which I have indicated does have some value and more coming. Now they can lock that price in for actually three years. So they're securing that discounted price for three years. That's why it shows 570 each of the next three years. And then again, customers ask, but then what happens in year four? And this, Greg, is what differs from any of the other promos that you'll see on our website and you'll see from time to time. That's like a one-year deal. You get an up or you get a discount, and then in the next year you would have to subscribe. At the regular price. Yes, the, the Adobe discount was one year. Back yeah, so did. for this program, we are actually offering these customers, a, in, as long as they continue to renew, we're offering them a discount in perpetuity. So they're actually getting, now we can't again be sure in year four and five what it looks like, but our guidance is that basically everyone is going to get up to about the same level in this kind of discount track. And it'll be about 630 a year in this case for AutoCAD. And that represents about 15% over their original maintenance cost. Okay, so it would be like another five from um, you know, basically the prior year. And so the point is just, that they can stay at that discounted track as long as they renew. So let me let me just uh, have you repeat that just to make sure I'm getting it. Yeah. So so we have a deal right now if we trade in our current license, perpetual license, mm -hmm. we get a discount. And that, is that discount, I believe in the letter was, 
sixty percent off. Is that well, correct? Well, okay. Or? Let me just clarify that. As I said, the way you actually compute the price is it's the same price as your maintenance, but it turns out to be about sixty percent less than the street price of the same subscription. Do you see what I mean? Okay, sort of. Yeah. So you're, if you compute so like the, the general maintenance the is what you're trying to shoot for is people who already own it is to equate the subscription price they're going to pay with what they're already paying maintenance. in maintenance. Okay. That is correct. And that represents like if you look at the subscription price we just had off at 570, that represents about 60% off what you would see on our website for the same subscription. It's what new customers would pay. Okay. is about 60% higher than that. So this is, you know, steeply discounted is the point. So let's just go over this one more time because I want to make sure I get this and, and everybody gets this. So, okay. So I have this, okay? Yes. And I bought this and I've been paying maintenance on it for about five years. Now, if I give this, trade this in, give this back to Autodesk, here you go, here it is. Take, I really like, it. this is my favorite tool. Second favorite tool, maybe. Mr. Smashy, I'll go like my hammer. This is Mr. Smashy. You can have it back. You can have it back. I want to give it to you. I'll, I'll, you can have it back. I get um, a, a discount equivalent to um, the first three years, essentially, or equivalent to or, or greater than what I would be paying for maintenance. That and is then correct. even in year four, it's possible the su subscription price goes up, but your goal is to for people who are trading in to in perpetuity be paying subscription once a year equivalent to what they used to pay for maintenance. Correct. I mean, as I said, by year four in your exact example, so you would be trading that in, you would be paying the same price for the subscription version of that in you know years one, two, and three, because you're able to secure that for a three year and you don't have to pay up front, you pay as you go, okay? And then in year four, it would bump up about 10%, which is about 15% over the original maintenance. So about a 10% increase is what our guidance is. We can't be 100% sure, but in that vicinity, Greg, and you would remain at that price, you know, subject to potentially minor price adjustments that any company would do, we're always gonna watch the market and our competitors. We're never gonna gouge our customers. You could always just drop subscription if you're not happy. So. The point is this discounted track, Greg, is forever well, to continue to renew. Right. right. Well, I, the problem is if you just drop subscription after three years, you don't have the perpetual anymore. And you also don't have your main, you don't have Mr. Smashy. So you can't right. do well, So you can't really just, it's hard to, I mean, it, it, you made it sound easy, right? You can't, it's hard well, I'm not, I'm to not, just drop. Yeah, I don't, I don't right. mean to sound it, that it's easy. Because right. as I said, like the guy I just talked to that has one seat, he said, I cannot feel comfortable in case I ever needed to go back to this version, giving this version up. And as I said, maybe right now he doesn't see that there's a greater good moving to subscription. Um, but once I shared with him the fact that he'd have access to all the prior versions that he downloaded and installed from that perpetual license that he'd be turning over, and once I shared with him that he retains rights to all of his files and intellectual property, this is not something that like is in the cloud and he can't get access to obviously you know you can create a universal file and take it into another product i mean there's options um my point is that this this is a price point that is only for those that want to make the move those that don't should remain in perpetual maintenance that's so, definitely an option right so we have we have uh, maintenance as an option you guys have documented the increase in that and um if we, again, I'm just recapping, just so everybody yes. real clear, because it gets confusing, and I think everybody in your position, I know Shane and Derek from Foundry were just like, they had the same conversations over and over and over, it's, and it's hard, because there's lots of permutations of this. So so the, the basic goal here, it sounds like, is if I'm a guy who buys maintenance every year anyway, which I do, and I go trade it in and go subscription, it's I'm, I'm not going to be paying any more than I was before because you're trying to keep that subscription cost the same as what maintenance was, correct? Generally, the, yes. Generally. generally. And on top of that, to sweeten the deal, we're going to have some additional 
benefits or services benefits. for people yeah. on subscription, which may be cloud rendering and maybe um, free trials for a month. You brought up be... a lot of good ideas, Greg. You brought <laughs> up a lot of good ideas. I'm gonna hold you to that flame one. Um, uh, honestly, you want more flame users? Let everybody on Maya try it for a month. Otherwise, it's you know it, it gets in front of them, they'll download it. But um, and so so you're paying about the same. You're gonna have some more services. Um, you're just you're just not gonna and you have access to up to three to four versions back. Is that correct? On um, yeah, if you depending like well, first of all, in subscription, you have access to three versions back. Three but versions then back. if you're one of these customers and you moved over to you know this uh, subscription model, whatever you traded in, whatever from that version you uh, downloaded uh, and installed, you're able to be basically access even if you made the switch to subscription. So 2012, and by the way, I kept this not because I'm some sort of hoarder, I just thought it was a cool box, and so I'm <laughs> sitting on my desk. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm so impressed. this is two 2012, and I actually had a cool like USB key in it or something somewhere, but so that's 2012, so yeah, look at that. Autodesk, this is back in the day you guys did this um, uh, so yeah. so I get so I have access from 2012 to 2017 if I trade in and that will just be in my account page and if I need to for some crazy or reason download yeah, yeah as long as the cuz I don't know your exact account specifics but as long as the version you're trading in that's under maintenance had those prior versions you know entitlements if you will those are the ones you retain even once you trade in that license Okay. Is the ones that you were entitled to for that license. And again, once I shared this with the guy I talked to about the one license, he said, you know, I, I need a safety net. And I'm kind of feeling like that might be a good safety net for me to kind of make that leap of faith. And it is a little bit of a leap of faith. My point is, if you're not ready to make that leap of faith this year, it's okay. We'll convince you in another year, I'm going to come back on this show and share with you the new things that I think really make subscription um, a better experience for our customers and why we're so passionate about making this like our choice for the future. That sounds good. So uh, it sounds like we've covered that fairly well. I think it's similar to what Foundry was doing. I think what they were trying to do is make essentially maintenance and subscription the same price. Um, however, they were uh, same kind of thing. They gave a bit of a discount on maintenance rather than than upping the the cost. If you did it every year, and if and if you skipped yeah. one, then you, then you got a, a cost increase. So it sounds like that's what you're trying to do, and you're trying to make up the difference with services and other things like that. Let me throw in another idea for your services. Okay. I think besides cloud rendering, uh, another um, method of creating content in our industry is photogrammetry. And so taking wow. pictures and having that uh, software, Autodesk has something called Recap and some other software that would yes. create uh, 3D meshes from photos. That mm -hmm. is, uh, and Autodesk had, had offered some of that as a free trial, I think, or at least as a beta version, similar to, I think, how Adobe does labs. So Adobe has software that's in the lab. They just let subscribers play with it and get that feedback yeah. loop going. I think that's important as well. So, you know, that is actually fairly computationally expensive. And as we move this world around us into 3D, right. um, offering a free, or not free, but part of your subscription, a, 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 a meshing service for photogrammetry mm -hmm. in the cloud using Autodesk's uh, data center would be something else that I think people would be interested in. So that's another thing, I think a carrot right. you can give yeah. people, that's something I would be interested in, in terms of like uh, my own selfish needs, but, um, Okay, so I think in terms of the letter, I know we're re getting close to an hour here, and I don't think I need to like go through it line by line. I already sort of did a did that. I think you've gone through it, but I want to give you an opportunity to, I, since your name was on it, and, and I, you know, which was nice. It wasn't just Autodesk, uh, you know, Teresa, and that's how we kind of got to this place. Um, mm -hmm. Is there anything else you wanted to talk about with regards to that? Do you feel you're you've gotten? what you wanted to say out or you, you know, I mean, take it I, away. I just want to, I want to say that, you know, I heard from a lot of customers that some of the words, you know, the way they took a lot of the factual information in the letter, it was not the best news of the day. You know, anyone facing changes like this, reading it in black and white, it's, it's probably going to frustrate many customers. And, and, and I think it did. Um, but I will say, Greg, we spent a lot of time at our company deliberating, you know, how much do we share? How much do we put in writing? How far out do we go? Do we just share our next year plans or do we actually share three years out? And we just decided as a guiding principle, we want 
to start building better relationships with our customers. I know that might seem hard to imagine with that letter, but really it was about transparency. It was about sharing the three-year plan. There was a lot of information to communicate, as you know. Um, again, I think every time I've had a conversation with a customer following that letter, they have been just completely relieved and they feel a lot better about it once they understand like their numbers and how they could actually potentially even save moving to collection. You and I are talking about spending the same. Actually, in many cases, there are savings. So the conversation is what we hope to, hope to prompt. And I realize many of our customers may be viewing today don't buy through our resellers. Well, that's okay. We are here, my team, myself included, to be able to handle any of the questions our customers have. So um, we have teams devoted to just this very thing. And I think that's hard to communicate in a letter, that we want a conversation, but we also didn't want people to learn about this like happenstance. I mean, we had to put the facts in writing, but we knew it would be tough. To do. Is, is there a good place where people can go there? You know, over the next couple of weeks, there's going to be a few thousand people watching this interview, uh, undoubtedly going to have questions. And, and, and while I suggest you maybe watch the comments section on YouTube at Pixel Fondue and feel free to reply to comments yes. there if you want. Is there a place that you think um, you want to put out there as a, as a place where a current um, uh, license holders and maybe future license holders can go to you know get in contact with a person like you? Right. I mean, I think the best place, I watch very closely our forums, um, our community, our Autodesk community. We have a very specific forum devoted to um, this M2S, we're calling it, which is maintenance to subscription. So I welcome them to comment on the forum and request a call. I'll certainly follow up. Another area, if you look at the In the Fold blog, I often will post updates there. I have a URL um, that they can click the link and, and just get to one of my folks on my team directly. So I welcome that, Greg. I really do, because it's the customer conversations that I think make people feel at least they have the facts to make their choices and they're not basing it on you know something they're interpreting from a letter. Right. So sounds good. So I think maybe we're about done. I don't know if there's anything else you want to add. I want to recap, just to recap. Um, so Autodesk is not going to continue to do a giant reversal after the Pixel Fondue <laughs> broadcast and add perpetual license, uh, continue to offer perpetual licenses. So you know, out of those of you out there who had your hopes up, sorry to inform you that is not happening. Um, I think there's a bit of new information. I think one, what happens after year three? Sounds mm -hmm. like we're trying to keep the same price as it would be if you were already on maintenance and if you were already uh, paying every year like I do. And I know it's a mental leap, but I, I talked about this before, like it is for me as well. Um, it's hard to jump off of something you own to the, kind of the exact same thing that it and on subscription. Um, that's why additional services and I think like that would really um, help people make that leap. Um, but you're going to continue to offer maintenance as an option, at least for the time being. There's going to be an increase uh, over the years, but but at least it's there. And you also have access to uh, past versions, uh, case by case, but up generally up to what you uh, originally bought your program at. And I think that's about yeah, I think that covers it. I look forward to seeing any announcements on cloud rendering or mesh retopology mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or any other sort of collaborative um, services or free yeah. trial for a week to all subscribers. Anything, any of those ideas I threw out there off the top of my head, anything like that uh, sticks, that'd be great. Um, and I think that's about it. I really thank you for coming on here. And uh, if anytime you want to do this again, give me a contact me. If you do show up at SIGGRAPH or any event like that, let me know. We'll probably be down there. And uh, SIGGRAPH's a big party. You'll have fun. Come on down. <laughs> All right, fun. Teresa. All Thank right. Thank you so much. All right. See ya. You bet. Bye bye. All right, Pixel Fun. Do I will get this up on YouTube with links um, to specific portions of this broadcast, hopefully soon. And I will see you at the next round table. Thanks a lot. And we are out. Right, thanks.